interesting, um, yeah, as my moment, and I know I don't like to walk down the hallway, so it's like an awkward side hug. <laughs> yeah, um, well, actually, as far as the problem of you guys clearing out for a little late, I thought like an innovative solution, just bring in the bell that you use at your school, and um, when you hear it, you know, second bell means if you're still in here and not your breakout session, you will get a tardy slip, and um, <laughs> Now, in all seriousness, I am going to be talking a little bit about my educational experience, which is a little different probably from most of your average students, because I do four classes at an online school and two classes at my local school um, at Brook and Mortar. And so I have the kind of experience of both going to school uh, using a computer, using the internet, and going to school in person. So I want to show you what my two binders look like. This is essentially my binder for my online space, or the computer, technically, that use iPad to. It's where I store all my files, my assignments, everything I'm preparing to turn in, all my notes, um, tests, work, etc. And this is the binder for my uh, for the two classes that I take at my brick and mortar school. And if I open it up here, uh, you can see that there's quite a lot of paper inside and um, some rubrics and uh, a, uh, something I was supposed to turn in on Monday. It still looks like all the homework when I get back. Uh, lots and lots of paper. <laughs> and as you can see, a little bit harder to manage. Now the reason that I was showing you the two binders um, is that I want to kind of contrast some of the tools that we're using uh, online and some of the tools being used at a regular school. And I think you need to multiply what's in my binder by three to get the amount that uh, the average student really probably likes around. Just think back to all the paper that you carry around when you were in school. Well, things really haven't changed one bit. I want to ask you, how many of you would buy ice cream from the grocery store, let it sit out on your countertop, melt completely, so it's nice and liquidy, then pour it into one of those ice cream maker things that you can whip it in shape and throw it back in the freezer again to make your ice cream. Well, that seems like a really stupid question because who would do that? And if you're wondering why I'm asking this weird analogy, it's because um, a few days ago something really funny happened in biology, the class I took at my local school. We had a substitute teacher, and every day in biology we start with a warm up answering a biology related question. Usually it's up on a PowerPoint slide. Um, behind the teacher. But today, it appeared that the PowerPoint slide had been printed out on a piece of paper and slid underneath the document camera, which was then being fed to the overhead. And I found that really ironic because there was actually nothing wrong with the computer. It was switched back and forth. Um, and I was wondering, you know, why take this too layover flight? I mean, there's cheaper drugs. The overuse of printing and perhaps underuse of some of the more modern tools available in that classroom wasn't an issue of access or money because this school district is in Microsoft's backyard. Like literally every kid has one parent or knows someone who works for Microsoft. And we have computers, um, lots and lots of computer labs, access to various websites. It's really, really rolling in technology. Um, but a lot of it isn't being used. In fact, I see in places where students might not have as much home access to computing that there are even more assignments that are utilizing technology. So I'm not advocating that we suddenly ban paper or printing, but our schools, classrooms, and curriculums need to balance this binder filling world of our teachers with the backlit screens of our students that we go home to after school and bring both the best of both sides of the classroom to achieve the theme of this conference, enhancing teacher effectiveness and improving student learning. Ask yourself, what do I see when I walk down the hallway at my school and look through the classroom windows? Do I see image number one, where biology students are busily um, centered around an iPad and manipulating a 3D model of an animal cell as part of the unit on cells, or even better, creating that model on Google SketchUp and posting it online for other students to use, move around, and learn from. Do I see image number two, where students are gathered around a computer 
and they're playing interactive video games such as Food Force from the World Food Program, which has been called the first humanitarian video game in both of six missions. You learn about hunger as a mission through this game. And then write blog posts with more information about the humanitarian mission and get evaluated by their peers. Or do I see image number three? Students hunched over their desks, pencils in hand, bubbling in answers and issue to erase any uh, stray marks clearly on one of those dreaded long test answer sheets. I have to clarify my desk testing. Um, I do think some of this could be done more effectively on computer. But what is so befuddling, and yes, that's a word, it's been our favorite since Dumbledore used in Harry Potter. What's so befuddling about the disconnect between image number one and two and image number three is the fact that I argue it's one and two that prepare students most for real life and they're most relevant and close to what we do after school anyway, and yet it's image number three that I see when I'm walking down the hallway. You might wonder what I mean when I say preparing students more for real life. I'm guessing that most of the problems you face throughout your careers, you know, you think back to your problems, the time that you had a really hard career decision to make, or the time that you had to get so much work in um, by a deadline. I'm guessing that most of the problems you face in your careers have in common with A through E multiple choice answers. The problems students are going to face are very complex, ones where we'll have to figure out our own answers and even create questions in the first place. The skills we get from analyzing, creating, and distributing. These are exactly the type of skills that I learned through organizing this youth conference, TEDx Redmond. Um, there's a new for TED, by the way. See some raised hands, but for those of you who are wondering who's this TED that people are talking about, well, TED stands for Technology, Entertainment, and Design. Check it out, it's TED.com. Um, thousands of free talks, and they're about all kinds of ideas worth spreading. So TEDx are the independently organized versions. And organizing a conference, like TEDx Redmond, taught me a lot about the type of skills that you would probably use in your everyday life. Better persuasive writing, because we had to write so many countless emails trying to raise money. Um, we would write differently based on our audience. We would say, okay, well this is you know, Abercrombie and Fitch, so they obviously don't value intellectualism, say, quite as much as they drop us, so let's change our approach. Uh, yes, we were very evil like that. And we also, uh, I also learned a lot about leading a team. There were 16 different young people who I was working with. Everyone had different opinions, commitments, vacation times over the summer holiday. And organizing, bringing all this together in time for September 10th. When you think about it, a lot of the skills that I was learning through this real world work of inspiring other young people, creating this conference, flying in speakers, raising money, um, this is the kind of thing, these are the kind of skills that you are trying to get across to students. And it's not just relevant to school, it's relevant to life. Then there's the second part, being most relevant or close to what we do after school anyway. Um, if you think about as parents, what do your kids do when they get home from school? If you're a teacher wondering about what your students do when they get home from school. How we learn in these two separate environments can be quite different. So when I get home from school, I turn on my computer, and even though I watch the news on the nightly news broadcast at 6, I don't wait for it to find out what's happening. If there's breaking news, I usually find out about it on my computer or smartphone. I found out about Osama bin Laden's death, and I noticed that there were a mysterious abundance of hashtag OBL tweets on Twitter. And while our teachers might not let us cite Wikipedia in a research paper, raise your hand if you have um, wills for students against using Wikipedia. Okay, I've seen some raised hands. Um, well, most teachers that I know won't let you use Wikipedia. Um, most of my peers use it for just about everything else. Recently I was reading um, about AP US history class I take, and for some reason I was really curious about one of my father's governor Morris, who is a big leader at the Constitutional Convention. So out of curiosity, I decided to go and look him up and discovered the interesting fact that he, to quote Wikipedia, um, died in 1816 after sticking a piece of whalebone through his urinary tract to the of blockage. <laughs> it's okay to laugh. <laughs> Um, actually, I just realized that laughing at this guy's um, sounds like a really painful death. Um, and this is true, I actually, you know, checked the, the footnotes and it's a Yale University webpage, so I don't trust Wikipedia, trust the office. And I went to Facebook to post this because I thought it was so like, wow guys, did you know that this really esteemed constitutional convention dude died through this 
you know, really uh, non-dignified way. And one teacher, Jeff Wickersham, teaches history, posted truthfully, the A-push test wouldn't touch this question with a 10-foot whale bone, <laughs> which I thought was pretty hilarious. Um, now, these are the kinds of facts that you discover through this sort of organic line. Here's from Bruno Morris, and I do not feel like reading the rest of my chapter, so that's what I'm going to go to Wikipedia and look them up. When you think of Facebook, the first thing that jumps to your mind is probably not a spirited discussion about AP classes, but more and more that seems to be what my Facebook life has been taken over by. Um, last weekend, I had to write about 28 miniature papers, uh, one to two page art criticisms for, you can probably guess, AP art history. And uh, we had, to tell the truth, it was a long term project. Our teacher did not actually assign us 28 papers on one weekend, but these are high school students we're talking about, so we procrastinated until the weekend before the day was due. Noticing that a lot of other AP classes at Redmond High School had their own uh, Facebook page, I was like, oh, why don't I set one up for APOL this high stakes weekend, so we'll have this place where we can answer questions. What exactly is the writing going to be about tomorrow? Stuff like that. It turned out to be really useful. And within hours, most of our class had invited their classmates, we had invited their classmates, and we were all in this group. We were posting, answering people's questions, um, commiserating with fellow procrastinators in misery. <laughs> you can see, um, I walked out some stuff, but um, I hope these people are mad at me. There's no teacher presence, as you can probably tell from some of the things that are being said about the homework. And that was honestly one of the strengths of the group, was that because students felt uninhibited, they were posting things and having a discourse that maybe would not have happened in class on a school monitor website. And this isn't unique to my local area. Many students are using Facebook all across the nation to try and um, you know, connect with other classmates, to try and answer questions, and maybe chat a bit too much as well. But you know, it's all it's all for sport. And now you don't have to go to someone's house to start a study group. You can have a Google Hangout, you can have a Facebook group chat. And I use Facebook to talk about APR history or even get biology homework from the day I was absent. I use YouTube to watch French videos and improve my pronunciation or review for the PSAT. But walk into school and what happens to YouTube, Facebook? Um, they're replaced with pencils and paper. And I'm not necessarily against filtering YouTube and Facebook because I totally understand that you know, thousands of students, not all of whom may have the French and PSAT on their minds. But you're not going to teach students digital literacy, a term that some of you have probably heard quite a bit, by never letting students go on an unfiltered, on the unfiltered internet. It's kind of like teaching someone across the street by saying, um, by kind of showing a picture of a street on a whiteboard and saying, look, the street is dangerous, but you know, we're not actually going to go over there. The idea of teaching these skills, which many title digital literacy or web citizenship, raise your hand if you've heard those terms more than 20 times. A lot of race more than 50 times. More than 100 times? Okay, well, I see that um, you've probably heard phrases like digital literacy, innovative technology, 21st century skills. How many of you feel like you have heard those a lot of times? Raise your hand. Okay, and raise your hand if some of you feel a little bit tired of them. <laughs> okay, I've seen some. Yeah, you don't have to be bashful about it, there's nothing wrong. Um, and many educators and journalists have questioned those terms and asked how relevant or how valuable are digital skills really. How many of you heard about this time piece or even read it? Digital literacy will never replace the traditional kind. Raise your hand if you've read that or heard about it. Okay, I've seen some raised hands. Well, it was a really interesting read, and basically it was bashing educators who advocate digital literacy called the term faddish, and to paraphrase said that online skills need a strong base of knowledge first. To quote the article, there is no doubt that the students of today and the workers of tomorrow will need to innovate, collaborate, and evaluate to name three of the 21st century skills so dear to digital literacy enthusiasts. But such skills can't be separated from the knowledge that gives rise to them. To innovate, you have to know what came before. To evaluate, you have to compare new information against information you've already mastered. Nor is there any reason that these skills must be learned or practiced in the context of technology." End quote. I fully agree with the idea that students need a strong knowledge base 
to complement their uh, development of digital skills. You're not going to throw a three-year-old who has not studied any math out on the internet to learn about calculus. You know, that would just be a little bit difficult. But in my experience, you can use your digital skills to help develop that knowledge base, and I don't see any reason why technology should be avoided. Using the internet doesn't mean that you won't read books, as the title of the article seems to imply, you will always remember the place of traditional kind. Um, I use the internet, and I also love to read. If you take my story as a case in point, um, this is me when I was three years old, tiny and adorable. And you can see me sandwiching with my mom, it's this, uh, all this way bigger now. And you can, uh, I mean, not mom, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that was not a practical, uh, practical thing to say. Okay, um, well, basically, that was me when I was little. I absolutely love to read. I would devour chapter books every single day. And my parents would have to drag me to dinner because really, we need to feed on words. That was my real brush. Now, I also watched TV quite a lot of TV in the wake of the CDC's new screen time regulations, Mom. But I think that my parents can justify their somewhat lax um, regulation of our screen time with the fact that we weren't watching Pokemon or Saturday morning cartoons. My sister and I were always tuned to PBS. We loved watching Between the Lions, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, Reading Rainbow, Cyber Chase, pretty much every single educational show that was on PBS. And we may not have realized it while we were having fun watching TV, but we were learning. And I loved using the computer. When my mom got me my first laptop when I was six, I would just you know, go there, burn up the keyboard. I was really unstoppable when it came to writing stories. And my parents still had to drive me to dinner because I didn't want to worry about silly things like eating when characters in my creation, like um, Princess Juliet and Lady Rowena, yeah, I came up with many names for characters. They were having a dramatic sword and dagger fight in the middle of the royal court over accusation of Countess Olga cheating at cards or something. That's a lot like Vegas, actually. Um, <laughs> hopefully you haven't seen any antics like that. Um, but basically, I was really into story writing. The computer made it possible for me to write more than I ever had before, because before I was limited quite a lot by my bad spelling, my messy handwriting, and by typing, not only did I have work, um, spell check, I could also type really fast, 60 words per minute, later 70, 80, um, I could type it 110 now if I really, really want to. And it allowed me to have that freedom, but at the same time, I didn't stop handwriting stuff completely. I improved my handwriting. In fact, I saw what text looked like on the screen, and I was like, I need to copy that. I need to replicate that, so my handwriting got better. And later on, I would play online games. Again, educational online games. And I can attest to the fact that I learned so much about science, history, and social issues through games on websites like NobelPrize.org, the um, United Nations website, it's the BBC Schools page. And there's an abundance of these free resources that students can really get excited about and that tie in perfectly to service learning, to science, social issues, standards, and stuff like that. Many nonprofits have created games that engage players and also teach about serious issues. Who has heard of free rights? Who has heard of free rights? Well, Free Rice is an amazing thing from the World Food Program. It's basically a trendy website where every single question you answer correctly, and like all kinds of topics, chemistry, languages, English, um, vocabulary, every single question you get right gives five grains of rice to the hungry through the World Food Program, and you don't have to donate anything because it's all done by sponsors. And you can use games like Free Rice and many of the other ones out there to teach students about social issues, which obviously come in as important in social studies classes without coming across as dry or overwhelming. Quite honestly, I've credited a lot of my knowledge about ancient Egyptian history to a somewhat gruesome interactive on the BBC. Yes, actually the BBC has this thing called Mummy Maker, where yes, you did read that right, you um, go through a very realistic process of removing organs and um, you know, adding salt and stuff. If I ever need to mummify someone in real life, I will have the knowledge, but <laughs> this is actually way funnier than the rest of getting really grossed out by the text here about the, uh, the vital organs have to be removed, preserved, and stored to be burned with Ramos. Um, I was really susceptible to learning history when there was removing bodily organs involved. I was a very gross seminal. Um, and so when you use games like this, it makes you realize as a child Wait, I'm not limited to learning about ancient Egyptian history from just reading a big old encyclopedia or from you know, hearing about the teacher. I can really learn anytime, anywhere. And I think that that was one of the most valuable things that my parents could have showed by letting my sister and I access all these different tools 
really emphasizing that, that learning takes place everywhere. You see how my early education was this perfect balance of the traditional, reading lots and lots of books. Even today, I, I read so many books. That I, um, you know, before I came here, I was in the middle of one. And I still watch TV. I still use the internet as well. You can balance it. It's not give and take. To go back to the controversial article about digital skills in Time Magazine, which said that digital literacy will never replace the traditional kind, I think it's true. Digital literacy won't replace being able to read, but digital literacy really has never tried to replace being able to read. I think that the fact that my parents didn't limit me to one medium or another, saying you can just watch TV, or you can just use a computer, or you can only read books and no screen time for you, was one of the most valuable things that they could have done. Because by allowing me to go from medium to medium and to have this continuous learning, um, discovering new content, knowledge, learning interactions, then again, I did understand learning could happen anytime, anywhere. And that's the first step to developing lifelong learners. And I hope that you'll agree with me that that's a phrase we'll never get tired of using. <laughs> Unexpected applause moment. Love those. <laughs> I've been incredibly impressed with the open-mindedness that and um, you know, creative use of technology that I've seen from going to sessions, from talking to teachers here. And I know that many of your students probably have the opportunity to learn across different mediums just as I did. I've been following education developments and discussions about how and where learning happens. I am a proud ASCD member. I love Education and Learning Magazine, and I was actually outside at the bookstore um, yesterday, and I was like, oh my goodness, $5 books. And I was, yeah, I can tell a lot about my personality for these speeches. Not only do I really love books, I also really love artists, um, when they come together, it's amazing. So, yeah, I've books, I really hope you're but I'll pay for the price for everything else too, it's value for them. Um, so, sorry about the tangent of amazing ASCD books, but I've been following these learning developments and education developments and how technology is kind of coming in uh, with pedagogy as well, and how many of you have heard of the concept of flipped classrooms? You can heard of flipped classrooms. Well, the flipped classroom idea is a pretty interesting concept. It's where the homework is to watch the recorded teacher's lecture, and the classwork is to do a project to, you know, have a discussion with people, write a paper, the stuff that would usually be assigned as homework. Math problems, for instance, if you imagine the same place in a math classroom, you would record your lesson about um, your slope and intercept, and then students would come to class to work on the problems, either collaboratively or individually, and get help when they needed it. So that would be the flipped classroom. Many teachers also use Khan Academy. Uh, Raising your hand, Khan Academy. Seeing some raised hands. Khan Academy is a nonprofit based on the work of Simon Khan, who's an ex hedge fund analyst who quit his job to develop his wildly popular video tutorials full time, and now has over 2,600 videos about math, science, history. And the Khan Academy model allows teachers to register their classrooms, have students watch videos, track their progress through quizzes and stuff, and um, really develop that kind of individualized form of them. Other teachers record their own lectures for students, post them on YouTube, Vimeo, SchoolTube, and I have benefited a lot from these lectures because I'll go online and you know, if I want help with my French pronunciation, then I look it up and go out there and have something. And I present to students over video conferencing almost every day about topics I've been reading and writing. I give presentations, and my mom is always there to record them, and I post them online on my YouTube page as well, and they're available without advertising for students and teachers to watch. Flipping the classroom can mean more time in class for fun stuff like collaborative projects and group discussion and more time for students to receive targeted help. And obviously it doesn't work all the time for every single subject, but I think that it's definitely worth giving a try sometime and maybe try saying, hey students, today or this weekend, you know, instead of getting the usual homework, your homework is going to be watching this lecture. And on Monday, we're going to come back, we're going to discuss it, we're going to look back at this passage of Hamlet and we're going to be um, you know, writing our first quizzes together or something. I think that it would be a really amazing thing to try and I know for one, speaking from slightly selfish interest, that a lot of my peers would love to have the videos watched as homework as opposed to the problems. So I want to really hear your opinion. Take a minute to discuss your idea of the flip classroom, how it might work or might not work in your classroom with people sitting around you. So the flipped classroom, do you think it would work or not? How might you use it?
Okay, does anyone want to shout out some ideas? Yeah. Okay, from their group. Does anyone want to shout out some ideas that they've heard from their group? Okay, anyone have ideas? Um, start randomly calling on people? No. Uh, <laughs> although I did watch this amazing uh, European film called The Corrective Institute for Parents, where parents basically underwent everything that children did, eating lots of vegetables and stuff. Um, funny film, and I was thinking, oh, if I replicate a classroom, randomly call on people, you'll feel that for a couple of weeks. Now, if you um, stand up and tell me, did, did you think that the flip classroom might work using it at least once in your classroom? Yes. yes. Our group talked about how we have different contexts, and in some contexts it might work very well because uh, then the teacher would have more time for, for practice yeah. and for students who are having difficulty with the concept instead of a more monolithic teaching. Yes, definitely. I think that that's a really important thing to realize. I'm not advocating that you use it in all contexts because, yeah, there are totally some lectures that you really have to be there. You have to be walking around. You have to be calling in students. It's very active interaction. But then there are some other things where, if, you know, students are going to be sitting in their chairs for 10, 20 minutes, not a whole lot of interaction. That might be something that might be better on a video and you can fast forward or replay it when you get confused. Definitely one of the benefits. And so students who might be um, kind of uh, left behind if you're going too fast or a little bored if, if it's too slow for them would be able to then really adjust it based on their learning speed. So that's definitely a big advantage. Are there any specific contexts in which someone can see it being used? And there's a microphone. Any specific context in which you could see yourself recording the lecture and assigning that as homework and then kind of taking what you usually assign as homework to do in class? living with classroom model. Any context? Okay, well, some of the examples, a lot of people have used it for math, assigning, you know, watch this lecture, perhaps open air cell, they'll see the 20 problems in class, and then students who need help can get it from their peers or get it from the teacher in class. And there you have the advantage also that if they're doing the homework wrong, then they can get stopped right away and like the right way. Uh, so earlier intervention, I guess. And I see things that it could have huge potential in, say, social studies, because I love social studies, um, but I think that a lot of the time it is maybe used on lectures that are that can be pretty dry, pretty you know, straightforward, 20 minutes, post online, and then let's take this for discussion, let's take this for looking at a current event, what can we do about this humanitarian issue, or uh, what do you think of this debate in politics, something like that. And there's way more time for that sort of thing. Now, you might be hearing this stuff about assigning lectures, um, doing stuff online, and think, well, a lot of students in my school district may not have computers or steady internet access at home. Raise your hand if this is the case in your school district, that not all students might have. Okay, I'm seeing some raised hands. So it looks like we have a lot of people here whose students might not always have that reliable computer or internet access at home. And in such districts, I know sometimes one-to-one -one computer loaner programs are established. Who here has a computer loaner program, one-to-one, -one, iPad, something like that in their school district? seeing some uh, hands raised. So I know that um, iPads uh, were assigned to every single student in Zealand, Michigan. This September I read about that online. And also that in schools where maybe not everybody gets their own computer, but that there are cards, there are computer labs generally available. And I heard from a teacher from Tennessee yesterday who said that her school had iPad parts and that they could reserve them and students could use them in the classroom. So there are definitely many ways um, for students who don't have access at home to get around that and many teachers who are going the extra mile to make sure these students have equal opportunities. Now how many of you have heard the phrase blended learning? Raise your hand if you've heard the phrase blended learning. Yep, that one's pretty common. It's a cross between online and in-person education. It doesn't just mean posting your PowerPoints online, it would actually mean a fairly significant part of the coursework or assignments curriculum being done online, and it could mean learning the majority of content online or, and then coming in for an in-person class once or twice a week, or it could mean the total reverse. Then there are completely online schools, like my school, Washington Virtual Academy, and you might wonder, well, how do you engage students when curriculum is online? Isn't this sort of just a lot of text, or does that get kind of boring? Well, there are ways online, for instance, discussion boards that students are required to do, so you'll have the question, um, how does the protagonist in the short story uh, exemplify some of the main um, characteristics common to 
James Joyce's work or something. And then, because everyone is required to respond, you hear from some of the quieter kids who in an in-class environment might not speak up, suddenly they're participating. So this is one of the advantages of something like an online discussion board, even for an in-person class, if you assign something over the weekend, you can say, okay, we're having this online discussion board, take your time to write a thoughtful post. There are countless teachers, many of Pretty much everyone in this room, I have heard amazing things from about how you're innovating, how you're using technology in new and creative ways to get students engaged in learning faster, smarter, and better. By changing the way that we think of teaching and learning as a very traditional, okay, let's sit down, take out your textbooks, do the reading, now we'll listen to the lecture, now we'll get a set of problems to do. By realizing that learning doesn't just happen in the traditional modes, that generally take place in the classroom, but also, and possibly sometimes more effectively, with different approaches like flipped classrooms, blended learning, individual and group technology use, and collaborative problem solving. We can all have a part in the changing landscape of today's classroom. But as I was writing this and thinking about, well, you know, learning doesn't just happen here, and it happens really across mediums, it can happen anywhere. Where, where does learning happen? Who do you learn from? As teachers, who do you learn from? From the examples of technology and flipped classrooms, it can obviously happen outside of our traditional concepts of learning and teaching, but there are many more ways as well. And one of the ways that I really emphasize, and those of you who have seen my TED talk will know this, is reciprocal learning between students and teachers. How many of you would agree with the statement, I can learn from my students? I'm seeing pretty much everyone raising their hand. Well, at its heart, I believe that learning is about connections, and student-teacher connections are incredibly important. The attitude that my students have something to teach me that you exemplify can come in especially handy when it comes to technology. Stand up if you've ever gotten tech support from someone younger than you. <laughs> stand up, okay, you can stretch your legs out. Woohoo, I need tech support. Um, stand up if that person was 15 or 20 years younger than you. Okay? Uh, stand up if they were 30 or 40 years younger. Okay? Stand up if they were 50 years younger. Okay, well, we know that you've gotten help from some very young kids, or, um, well, let's move on. <laughs> I've provided some tech support myself on occasion. Um, a lot of times from my mom, also to my dad, I my dad came here today. But he's been interested in Facebook for quite a long time, but it was only in October that he set up an account. And what's so nice about my dad being on Facebook is that it's given my sister a chance to finally teach him something. Usually it's us pestering him with questions. Dad, what's the deal with ionic and covalent bonds? Of how do I solve this inequality? He gets all of our math questions because he's the PhD in the house. So uh, they say that old dogs can't learn new tricks, but this is totally not true because I've seen my dad latch on a Facebook and he's tagging people in pictures and posting on walls. And um, when he started liking everything that my sister posted, she uh, added to him to a family list, which is sort of like the uh, Siberian exile of Facebook. But <laughs> before that, he was um, very much in favor. And I also set up a blog for him. Uh, somewhat grudgingly started posting. John of Ctalk.blogspot.com, check it out. It has awesome eccentric articles about French press coffee and Twitter and pretty much everything else. And I also showed him the basics of an interactive whiteboard and my sister and I are responsible for getting hooked on angry birds. So yeah, you can thank us for that. But the funny thing is, is that my dad being online might actually equal more in-person conversation because suddenly we have this discourse about something that we have in common. Whereas before my sister and I were, I mean, maybe my mom were really the only ones who could talk about Facebook and be like lists and tagging and wall posts and all these foreign terms. Now it's like my dad suddenly learned this new language. So if you need help adopting technology in the classroom, get students involved. You don't have to pay them a whole lot of money, actually. Yeah. Probably I would bring up paying them. And technology being adopted in classrooms builds on the student teacher relationship, giving students an opportunity to um, feel like they're really helping out. Now, admittedly, technology being adopted in classrooms is nothing new because I know that a lot of you have probably seen um, the great innovations of the document camera, the in class television, the overhead projector, the interactive whiteboard, the list goes on and on as far as things that you thought in your classroom. But the difference is that now that many of the developing technologies that are shaping our world and that are being advocated for use in the classroom are designed for individual use, recreation, and consumption. Take the iPad, for example. 
The iPad isn't really designed for showing videos to a group of 30 people. Well, you, that can be done with your into and stuff, but the iPad is obviously more a tool for the individual. You hold it in your hands, you manipulate the stuff on screen, and that takes control away from the teacher and attention away from the front of the class because suddenly you have students who are all hunched over their iPads and not looking at you. And you can see it really shown here in this picture where the students are looking at their screens and their screens. To me, the number of students looking at their screens in this picture is a plus, not a negative, because there's an opportunity for learning on every single one of those screens. And the fact that they're staring so attentively at their screens and they're not asleep on their desks means that every face is engaged in at least an opportunity for learning. And isn't that the reason that you want student attention to be focused on the teacher in the first place, right, for learning? Now with technology, you can extend the hand of learning in every student's face. Um, that actually sounded unintentionally really creepy because I'm imagining now like this scary hand coming getting out of my iPad. But it's really something that I mean and I think of highly. The reason that I find this technology so awesome, you've heard me go on and on about how much potential I think it is here, is because it actually isn't because of the engaging students factor. It's because of the empowerment factor. Tools like the iPad, computers, um, blogging, etc., allow students to create content, not just taking, but making. Google SketchUp to make 3D models of animal cells for biology. The free audio recording software Audacity to make professional podcasts for, uh, about current events or social studies. Final Cut Pro for a professional movie of your group's production of Hamlet for language arts. Free zooming software, because that's what I'm using right now, for a visual journey through Paleolithic artworks for your art history class. MathTrain.tv, where students make excellent tutorials about um, all kinds of subjects having to do with math. Peers teaching their peers online, and maybe just also teaching you. Learning from students isn't just limited to technology use or content creation. I highly recommend trying to gather a group of students in your class, sitting them down, and asking them how do you feel about your educational experience or what are the qualities that you would like to see invested during it? A lot of you do inventories at the beginning of the year where you ask for a list of questions, ask about students and you know, what sports do you play, and, what, and you might ask questions like what qualities do you see in the best teacher, but um, you know, students don't always answer those very thoroughly, and I think gathering a group of students for an honest discussion about how they feel their educational experience might be improved is an amazing idea. Or if you think it might be better, or get people to open up more, you could even I don't know, do a form in spring and get anonymous comments, although I would warn you, you may hear some um, pretty blunt things. Students hear a lot of feedback from teachers on a daily basis, but I haven't seen examples too often where teachers are setting up some kind of open form for students to say, hey, you know what, um, there's a tool 